Amen. All right, so what book we're in? Kaiser Terra or something? One of them? Oh, it's Romans, yeah, Romans. Yeah, I knew it was one of them Romanians or something, one of them. So what chapter are we in? You were close. Oh, but we finished nine last time, didn't we? Yeah. What's the date you got there? Oh, okay. Nine twenty-eight, huh? Well, I think what I did last week is I went ahead and read it and said we'll move into chapter ten, but we'll go ahead and read it. Uh, again, it's always worth reading. So here in nine Romans chapter 9 and verse 28, for we will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed. We had been as Sodom and been made like an unto Gomorrah. And most of us know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, so you pretty much know what Paul's telling them. And uh, if you look back to 7, he also he uses Isaiah. He said also, Isaiah also cried concerning Israel through the number, through the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. And uh, 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 the remnant uh, shall be saved. So he said that there will be a uh, number of Israel will be like the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven, really. In uh, other words, they're going to be without number. And so uh, he also says here that uh, out of that, God's got a remnant. He's got a remnant. And a remnant means he's got some set aside, some that he knows won't won't give up on him. So a lot of Israel gave up on him. There were thousands of Israelis saved at the time of Christ at Pentecost, but that's just a remnant. The thousands that didn't believe were were you know a whole lot more than the ones who did. And that's why God. You know, I, I firmly believe the Lord would have turned around and came back and set up his kingdom if Israel would have repented. But because they did not, then he turned unto the Gentiles. He called out an apostle named Paul, and he gave the apostle the instructions of what he wanted these Gentile and Jews in this age to believe. And he gave him the mystery, which is called the gospel. So if you want to know where the gospel came from, you won't find the gospel until Paul arrives. And Paul don't arrive until you get to chapter 9. In chapter 9 of Acts, Paul gets saved. And you know how he got saved. The Lord ran him down the middle of the street and the road to Damascus and blinded him. And voice sounded like thunder to everybody that was around him. And told him, hey, Paul, why do you keep kicking against this sharp, sharp thing here? And, and of course, you know, Paul, <laughs> he must have been, I think, you know, that he must have been under conviction about it. Because, and the Lord knew that uh, he must have dealt with the, Paul before because he asked him, why do you keep kicking against this, you know, this prick? Why do you keep doing that? And, um, and of course, Paul, he, did, he couldn't even question it this time. He just simply said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And I, I, that's a great thing. I mean, I think everybody should feel that way when the Lord moves on them. Amen. And he comes in your heart. You say, Lord, what would you have me to do? I want to be part of this. What do you want me to do? Well, the Lord had big plans for Paul. And Paul was going to be the Gentile to the apostles. And so if you know the story, he went down into Arabia to Mount Sinai and 
and sat at the foot of the mountain and met Jesus there. And for about three years, he was ministered to by the Lord himself. And he was given the gospel. And so when he came back, he's preaching a different gospel than Peter's preaching. And so he had to straighten Peter out on the gospel. And, of course, Peter and that group from Jerusalem, they were saying, you know, yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, and you got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. That's not the gospel. That's wrong. Now, that's tribulation doctrine. In the tribulation, you'll find out you got to believe in Jesus and keep the law of Moses. You see, every cult, Every false religion has good scripture. They just apply it in the wrong place. And if you want to find out what the church believes or what teaching is for the church, you've got to go into the Pauline epistles to find it out. You're not going to go in the gospels and find it out. And so it's not till we get to the epistles do you actually learn what real doctrine, real Christian doctrine is. And in... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells you what the gospel is. Amen. And basically, it just says there that, according to the scriptures, that he died on that cross and he was buried. And then in three days, he rose from the grave according to the scriptures. So Paul tells you that it's, the, the real gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection, and not just the death, bur death burial, and resurrection, but the way the Bible said it would happen. You know, that's why John MacArthur, you know, like John MacArthur made that statement, uh, the blood has nothing to do with it. He said if Jesus would have poisoned himself, you'd still have salvation. And I'm saying, well, what's all this blood through the Old Testament? What's all that blood about? Well, it's because the Lord was the Lamb of God who had to shed that blood on Calvary because his blood is what had to cover the sin of the Ark of the Covenant. And so, you know, I, I used to feel like that uh, uh, the Lord went down into hell and preached, and somehow in three days he spent eternity. But you know what I came to, to realize? That's, that's, that's probably not what happened. I know he went down, and I know he talked to him, and I know he went into hell, and he, he talked to the spirits that were there, which were spirits or angels, Okay. That's what he was talking to, fallen angels. And, and souls are men. Because when Adam, God breathed in Adam, became a living what? Soul. Living soul, not a living spirit. He became a living soul. And uh, angels are ministering spirits. That's what the Bible tells us. So when, it tells, when he tells us he went down into, into uh, paradise and then he went into hell where the spirits were held in prison, He's talking about those fallen angels. And the fallen angels had begged for forgiveness. There's no forgiveness for them. You know why? Because in order to forgive an angel, since they were created individually, he would have had to die for each and every one of them individually. Where for us, he dies for Adam. And we're all covered under Adam. Because we come from Adam. See, We all come from the same that same seed. And uh, so this last Adam, all he had to do was take the place of the first Adam, and then we all get born again in the last Adam. And so as you get born again, then you take on a new nature. Uh, as Peter said, you become partakers of the divine nature. That divine nature is a godly nature. That's what Adam lost in the garden when he sinned. Amen. You see, when uh, God said, now Adam, you can do it. Any, you can eat any of these trees you want, all of them. And he says, but don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, of good, uh, the tree of good and evil. And so the tree of knowledge. And so, but you know the story. Eve got tempted, of course. If you're going to tempt a man, it has to be from the woman, right? <laughs> she's, she's got that way. She knows how to tempt him. But she says, come on, Adam, this is pretty good stuff. Try it. <laughs> And you look at her, and you look at the apple, and you look over here where she's not. And I'm sure Adam was saying, you know, God's going to kill her for eating this. Because he said, the day you eat that, you're going to die. And I'm sure he's thinking, 
He's taking her. I'm not going to live here without her. And he takes that fruit and <clears throat> give me a bite. Now he has to kill both of us. And we'll both leave. He didn't want to live without her. Otherwise, he wouldn't eat that fruit. I can tell you, Adam was no dummy. Adam was probably, probably, I would say he had, his mind was far superior to any mind you'd ever see today. Amen. And that's why I always said if there was anything, uh, space travel, you know, any kind of, uh, you seen this stuff, beam me up, Scotty stuff. If any of that stuff ever existed, it was probably back before the flood. I think they had abilities to do things we can't do today. And I believe if we could use all of our mind power, you know, we only use, like, like women use the left side and men use the right side, but we don't, I don't know anybody used the whole brain. And if you had the ability to use that whole brain, what could you accomplish? It's hard telling. You know, it's just, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, uh, unlimited, probably, the Lord says, if you can think of it, you can do it. That's what he says. So what have you thought about in your lifetime? You know, if you thought about it, you can accomplish it. So that's why I always say when it comes on TV and sci-fi, sci just wait a few years. <laughs> you see somebody doing it, and that's how it works, actually, you know. And a lot of things I've seen as kids, like, you know, Flash Gordon going to the moon. You know, we thought that was hilarious. You know, nobody's going to go to the moon. Look how far that is. And then all of a sudden, boom, a moon shot in the 60s. And then they're walking on and they're flying around it. Now, moon's nothing. Now they got, they got a space station on one of Jupiter's, I think it's Jupiter's or Saturn's one, uh, Titus, the, the moon Titus. Is that Jupiter or is that Saturn? It's Jupiter, ain't it? Titus. There's 12 moons on Jupiter. One of them's Titus. They got a space station on Titus. And they're, you know, checking that place out, looking for life. And so they always say we're trying to find plants we can colonize, that if something happens to the earth, we've got a place to go. And they're looking for But really what they're really looking for, you know what they're really looking for? To disprove God. If we can find life somewhere. And you know what the media, you're talking about, you know, Trump brought it out, of course. Uh, Trump's the one that brought everybody's attention to uh, how crooked the media is. But really, the, the, ever since the 60s, would, you know, the media turned. Something happened to them, and uh, they push an agenda. They get an agenda, and they start pushing it. And there was, a, like, you remember they found, a, they said it was a, a rock from the moon they found in Antarctica. Yeah. And this moon from the rock probably has life on it. And they made a big... I mean, a big headline in the paper. Maybe it's front page. I don't remember. But, uh, and it said this, Moon Rock may have life from Mars, found in Antarctica. But you never seen them come back when they didn't find any life on it and have a big page. They had a little article somewhere in there about that big that said, uh, sorry, there's no life on it. <laughs> but they didn't come back and make a full page to explain uh, that, yeah, that's sorry about that rock. It didn't have no... No, they wanted to push that because they want to hurt people's faith. They, they want you to deny God and, and not have faith in the Bible and all those things because there's a lot of things the world would like to do the church stands against. The only thing that stops darkness is you. <laughs> Once you shut up, when the pulpits get quiet in America, America will be like any other country whose pulpits are quiet. Just like China, just like North Korea, just like Russia, just like any other country that's there had no pulpits. The great thing about America is the pulpit. It's the people who used to stand up and they used to preach against sin and they tell what's right was right and wrong was wrong and you need to quit doing it and you need to live right and they don't do that anymore. Now they bring people in and pat them on the back and tell them how wonderful and great they are and they don't care what you're doing. This whole group over here, they all mix um, matching and swapping wives. And, and this group over here is all homos and nobody's saying, hey, this is great, you know. And we got, the, we got up here the homo choir with, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. I seen this church the other day in this choir 
the choir director, if he wasn't gay, I'm not a man. <laughs> He's leading the choir. Okay. <laughs> you know, and here's the thing. I would treat a homo just as good as I treat anybody else. I mean, they're just a sinner like anybody else is a sinner, okay? And they're welcome to come here. But if I know you're still living in your sin, you're not going to be my choir director. You probably won't take up the offering. You probably won't even be greeting people when they come in the door, but you're welcome to come. But when you realize God's more important than you are, then that's when you can start serving him. Amen. Then you can start doing things for him. But no, I'm not going to put you in front of everybody and say this is acceptable because God says it's an abomination. Amen. That's the way it is. And that's the same way with any sin. Now, you can, you can live in sin and not, I not know it, and you, you could be up here singing specials and doing everything. I don't make it a habit to try to find out what you're doing. <laughs> I expect you to have a relationship with God and, and clean up your life. But if it comes to my attention and everybody's saying, do you know that he's uh, or she's uh, living with somebody and it's not their husband or not their wife, and they're doing this and this and this and going to the bar, and, did you know she was a stripper? <laughs> uh, uh, no. <laughs> now I do. Quit telling me stuff. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, then you'd have to you deal with it, you know. And uh, because people would know that, and it would actually hurt your church in the long run to allow it to go on. But we got great churches like Andy Stanley, that big 20,000 on Sunday church he's got, where homosexuality is accepted. Matter of fact, I read an article the other day where he had a homo helping him. He got advice from the homo how to minister to the homos. <laughs> so, I mean, what can I say? We've got to be sensitive. We live in a sensitive world, and, uh, and that's the way they look at it. And, they, you know, they run their churches like the world would, and they're more interested in how many, vis how many uh, bodies I can have in that church than they are whether you're right with God or not or whether you get saved or not. I don't know if they preach anything about salvation or much or whatever they do because I don't listen to them. But I do know that most of them are just like the crossroads we have here. Bless their hearts. And uh, Brian Tomey, I guess his name is, the pastor. And he's the main pastor over all the crossroad churches. And on Sunday, he preaches and they, they um, broadcast the service to all the satellite churches. And so everybody in the satellite churches gets to see the main service. But they had a men's retreat last year. I'm sure they had this year too, but last year, and I had a fella. I'm not going to give their names because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Oh, there's a Wendy there. But um, we had uh, this fella here, and him and I got talking, and he was fairly a new Christian, but his son had just got into to the church, and he was attending church at the crossroads. And I, I'd like to get excited about that, but I had a hard time doing it. I can't. Because his son went to the men's retreat, and his son thought it was so cool that his pastor, the first thing he said to him when he, 1,500 men there, by the way, the first thing he said to him is, I got liberty today to use the F-bomb five times in my sermon. He said he used them in the first five minutes, <laughs> all five of them. Now, I wasn't there, and I'm getting all this hearsay, but that's what the man told me, and I'm not going to lie to you about it. That's just what he told me, and I, I kind of believe it because they had communion one time. They used champagne and pastries. And Brian told me drank beer from the pulpit to show him it's all right to drink. Now, one of the things in the Bible that was an abomination would have been to drink wine from the tabernacle or the uh, temple. The priests were not allowed to do that. 
of the peace people who was in charge, it was a no-no. And so, okay, I, you do what you want, but I think it's it's sad. When you should be up there blasting it, saving lives and helping people be better, you're up there encouraging it. Clay? I think he is. All they'll say, it's only moderation. How many ever drink? Who? Anybody used to drink in here? How many of you drink in moderation? <laughs> Once you get drinking, that moderation stuff goes out the door, doesn't it? You get with your buddies, and they say, we'll just drink a couple. Well, that couple turns into a 12-pack, you know what I'm saying? And when that ball game's over, we all play ball together. Uh, we get a keg. And we didn't leave till the keg was gone. And we left like this. Uh, that's not good. One guy where I worked at, he said, you went to the doctor. And the doctor told him, how much do you drink? He said, well, I drink you know, once in a while. He said, well, I'm going to cut you out of all your drinking, but just take I use a big shot glass. <laughs> Six ounce <Yeah>. one. <laughs> I know it's not funny because I read the stats one time. How many people die? And it started out with automobile crashes every year. Not just in America, but all around the world. There's hundreds of thousands. And then it went into... Um, uh, uh, the damage it does, like hardness of the liver and all that kind of stuff, uh, turns into like liver diseases and and the other things that do to your body. You know, kind of messes up a lot of people's blood veins and things like that. And and then it went into how many families it destroyed and how many divorces over this alcohol. But see, if they really wanted to save save lives, just get rid of alcohol. But that's not what they want. There's too much tax money on it. We're never going to get rid of that, you know. And people like it, especially those guys. And the guys that make the decision. You know what? President Trump has never touched alcohol in his life. A fella told him a long time ago, uh, an alcoholic, who was a good friend of his, and he gave him some advice. He said, he said um, Donald? Whatever you do in life, don't touch that stuff. And he told him that over and over, and, and it stuck with him. And he realized, he watched this guy, and he realized he didn't want to be like that. And he said this guy was brilliant, probably smarter than him in business and everything, but he had a drinking problem, and it destroyed him. Greg? Uh, that's possible. But his, his kids are the same way. Donald Trump's kids don't drink or smoke. He didn't drink or smoke either one, neither did his kids. So they, I mean, they had some, they have some morals about them, some character. <clears throat> where are we? First one? Oh, no, we're up here yet. Let's get back up here where we were. Uh, we were reading down. Let's finish reading down. Uh, we were talking about uh, using, um, let's see, what did I say here? Isaiah 27? It cries concerning Israel through the number. I'm talking about the the seed uh, here um, in 28, and he will and he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because of short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And then he mentions Isaiah and said again, before except the Lord of Sabbath had uh, left us a seed, we had been of Sodom. And, all, and, and been made also as Gomorrah. And we were saying most of us know Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how we got into that. 
But Sodom and Gomorrah were by, they were located there in Israel by the Red, by the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea, uh, these cities, but it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the surrounding cities also. And God rained down fire on them uh, for their immorality, and I think most of it had to do with um, homosexuality because Lot offered his daughters and they refused them. They wanted the angels. They wanted the males. And so I think it, it was a lot of that. And that's funny, too, because have you noticed that, a lot, like the, say, the gay rights parade? It's not about, really, I mean, what the persona that they present to us is not about a loving relationship. I mean, they're marching, I don't know how to say this in a mixed crowd, <laughs> they're marching down the street with, with uh, statues of, you know, men's things and, uh, and worshiping, them, worshiping them and uh, all kinds of, and jerking their clothes off and all that kind of stuff. Uh, somebody just posted, I thought, uh, I've, I've seen it, but they said that uh, at Disney World, someone got on the ride, the uh, Little World ride or something. I forget which one it is, but it's Little World or this is a Small World or something ride. But anyway, they got on that and took all their clo clothes off. And we rode the ride, strip start naked. <laughs> and I said, you know what? That's demonic. That's demonic to do that. That's what a, a demon would do. Jerk his clothes off, you know. Just because that's God tell you to cover it up, he'd do the opposite. Modesty means to have your body covered. That's what it means. Cover your body. Um... Not that we, you know, like men, they don't mind looking at a woman's body. So that had nothing to do with what we like or not, but it's just what God said. And we do what God says. That makes it right. And God says it. He says it for a reason. Here he says in verse 30, What will we say then that the Gentiles, which follow not after the righteousness, has attained to right has attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is which is of faith. And when we talk about faith, you look back, we usually refer uh, back to Abraham, but in Abraham's day, I think faith was even a little different than it is in our day. It's always believing God, but um, I don't have the verses here. I'd lay them down for you to show you that it states it just a little bit different. I think in Abraham's day it was faith, having faith in his faith, and ours is having faith in God in Jesus Christ. So there's a little difference there. And uh, I think in Abraham's day, even though his faith, but he had to demonstrate his faith. You find out, like, you go back in the Old Testament, go back before the flood, and that we call that the age of innocence. But in the garden, you know, where it's perfect, when you say that would be an age of grace, but really it wasn't because God gave him a law. He had one law to keep, and he was supposed to keep it. And if you've got a law involved, then it's really not grace. And so God said, uh, don't eat of that fruit, and everything's going to be good. The day you eat of it, I'm going to kill you. And so that's what happened to mankind. Uh, they did eat. But we find that after that, when they were kicked out, that there was no law. So from then, past Abraham to Moses is what we call, that was like a state of grace. It was like a can't, sin can't be imputed to you because there's no law that you were told you had to keep. So they were all kind of like we are today in the church. Really, we know what the laws are and are written in our hearts, but God hadn't given us a law. He never came down to uh, Mount Sinai uh, to the Gentiles and said, you know, here's the law. I want you to keep it. But he never did that. But Paul reiterates that, no, there's nothing wrong with keeping the law, but 
Remember, it doesn't have nothing to do with your salvation. You couldn't keep it in the first place. That's why he had to come. So he's not encouraging you. When you read through here, sometimes you read him and it sounds like you need to go out and sin a little more and make God look better. <laughs> like he's telling you to sin, but that's not what he's telling you to do. He's, tell, he's telling you how great God's grace is no matter what your condition is. And that uh, it's good enough to forgive anything. And don't ever think you're going to be good enough to help God. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And here's the thing. When you say, here's what they're saying, and I hate to do that. I'm going to get a lot of people mad at me right here. But what they're saying when, they, when you do that, because I know Ruckman, he talked about sitting down with this uh, backslidden Pentecostal preacher. And this guy, you know, he used to preach for the Lord and everything. And he say he walked up, he's sitting on the porch in a T-shirt, drinking a beer, smoking a, smoking a cigarette, watching the ball game. And he walked up to him, he started talking to him. He said, I know, I know all about it. He said, I used to be a preacher myself. He said, used to be? He said, yeah. Where'd you preach at? And he found out, you know, he's a Pentecostal preacher. He said, well, why ain't you still in it? He said, well, I found out I couldn't live it. He said, I don't think that it's ever going to work until you come to the point in your life where you can live it. And Ruckman's saying, you mean you tried it once before and you couldn't do it? And said, now you're living in this state and you're definitely not doing it. And you think there's a time going to come when you can do it? You think that time's coming? And uh, he never could convince that guy that that time's not going to come. You have to let the Lord help you, you know. You've got to invite the Lord into your heart, and then the Lord will help you overcome those things. But you, <laughs> you're never going to overcome them when you're, you're thinking that you have a part to do. Because what you're saying to him is, you're not good enough. i got to do this. So you're saying you're better than God. That's what you're saying. Just don't realize it when you do that. What you're really saying is, I'm better than God. I can, if I can't do it, I'm going to hell. If I do do it, I'm going to heaven. I'm better than God. He can't do it for me even though he never sinned, even though he kept the law, even though he's the only one that ever did it, ever did this, ever did that, and he's done fine. But you can't do that? Then you better trust in him. The one that did it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? His righteousness will cover you. You got to put your faith and trust in him because you're not going to do it. And it's hard to tell people who believe their work salvation. It's hard to tell them when you say that. You're saying you're better than God. Because that's what you're saying. God couldn't do it, but I can. Then you're saying you're better than God. If he can't do it, you can they don't realize that's why he came, because you couldn't do it. Amen. He's bailing us out. We just don't realize it. <laughs> yeah, that's why he came. And he came seeking the lost, not the, not the saved. He's looking for the sinner. He's out there. He come looking, seeking him. And uh, when we put our faith and trust in him, then he takes care of it for us. And by the way, it's, a, it's a left, the rest of your life journey. To, to follow him. And that's why I'm, I'm going to tell you, a lot of times we tell people, follow Jesus, but Paul says, you know, be a follower of me. Because he was a follower of Christ. But Paul says, be a follower of me. Now, there's two reasons he said that. One reason is because Paul had the gospel. Jesus didn't teach the gospel of grace. Jesus taught the gospel of the kingdom. And that's why they went by John's baptism, because during the tribulation, they will baptize people into the kingdom. It's going to happen. But right now, what he's telling them, um, uh, God, what, what was I saying? I done got off track now. I'm talking about kingdom gospel. The tribulation baptized in the kingdom. Huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, because Paul said to follow him because 
He got his message from Jesus. So don't necessarily follow what Jesus was teaching about the kingdom, but follow what Jesus wants you to have in this dispensation about grace. So be followers of me as I am of Christ. That's what he's saying. The other reason he said that is because we're supposed to be examples. Amen. We'll live our whole life repenting constantly. I mean, if a person thinks they are without sin, uh, what's the Bible say? If you, think, if you say you haven't sinned, you make him a liar. What you're doing when you tell people, when you tell God or anybody, oh, I don't sin, well, you're, you're making God a liar. He knows better. Are you telling me you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing? See, there's sin, sins of commission and there's sins of omission. And we commit sins, but also we leave things undone we should have did. And the Bible is both, and both of those things are missing the mark, which miss the mark, you trespass. You, you, you create a, a sense of iniquity, and that's sin. You missed the mark. You ain't doing it right. You're not doing it the way he told you. And that's sin. And that's what we're going to quit right here. But I, this is one of the reasons I always say that we have believing unbelievers. <laughs> oh, yeah, I believe God to get saved. But I don't believe God wants me to do this or wants me to do that. Or I can't. I'm not studying my Bible. I'm not going to Bible study. I'm not uh, going out on visitation. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to do any of those things. Well, you will after a while. It takes a while sometimes. But once you fall in love with God, it's a joy to do it. It's a joy to do it. But that, you know, love affair sometimes takes a while. Most people think that little fascination you have when you meet your wife and she's your girlfriend and you're fascinated and taken with her and you're saying, oh, I'm so in love. I know I am. I feel it right here. It tickles and tingles and all that. And them little girls are calling you every day, you know, and it's so fun. But then after about a year or so of marriage, that wears off. You come in, man, they got a mop. They're going to whack you up the head with it because you left them to clean up your mess. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I always tell people I was the first preacher to walk on water. <laughs> and I got slapped upside the head with that mop after I got done, too. Now, if you want to learn by the, you want to learn how to live by the law, get married. <laughs> so, but uh, there's nothing like it, you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, it, it's got all of its joys. Hmm. Say, so who are you listening to? But there's his letter. But that Holy Spirit bears witness to it. So you have two witnesses all the time when you get in that book. He speaks to you. Then that, wit that Spirit will bear witness to it. Amen. He's helped you. Amen. Any others? And let's be this. Oh, Bill, go ahead. Oh, 
Amen. I know. I think that's one of the things like, well, when we get into chapter 10, I better quit. It's getting late. I'll tell you this next week. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that, I think. Who can bring him down from above or go into the deep and bring him up? Can. So you can't bring Christ back every time you take a bite of bread and he becomes his body. You know, they're so, yeah, I know what you're saying. You can't do it. You can't bring him back down here and eat him, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Don't happen. But they really think something. It really turns into his body when they take that communion. But, no. Yeah. Well, let's pray, folks. Father, we love you. Lord, we need you in our lives so much. Father, we pray you open our understanding, God, of your word. And, Lord, that it will set us free. The truth sets you free. And, Father, we ask, God, that you'd help us reach out to others, Lord, and share your word with them. And help us be a good witness and a good testimony to others. And, Lord, that through it somehow, God, that people will want to come and get what we got. And we thank you. We love you. We need you in our lives so much. Keep us safe throughout the week and bring us back on Sunday. And we thank you for all the things you do in Jesus' name. Amen.